often complex and ambiguous um, environments. Today's currency for competitiveness is talent, knowledge, and leadership. And obviously, that puts empowered, engaged people um, and not have an actual mindset on an end. Our people in organizations, they are overworked, they are stuck. Anyone can do HR, or HR are not the, the, the smartest tack in the box, or um, everyone hates HR, HR is just a happy police. Uh, these are things that we hear in organizations, uh, but a lot of it is really unjustified. And many of these um, complaints actually come, sorry, actually come from the fact that we have hidden forces in HR. We have especially finance and legal that dictate a lot of the things that we do in HR. To give you an example, hiring freezes is not an HR invention. It's not HR that says, oh, I think it, it's a great idea um, to, to force you um, not to, to recruit the skills that you need. It's finance who comes in and says, no, no, it's October. We better not hire anyone anymore. The same is true with the legal. We have so many constraints in our organizations today that are dictated by legal that we cannot talk to our people anymore. Legal makes sure that we can only ask a certain set of questions, that we have to tick certain boxes, and that we cannot have a conversation. So these are the things that we have to fix. Another issue is that our HR instruments are driven to handle poor performance and mediocrity. And that is something we have to fix. And another thing is we have to make up for weak managers and uninspiring leaders. How did performance management get to the point where they are today? Performance management initially started out um, as having a corporate goal and making sure that everyone in the organization works towards that one common goal. But that's a, a far cry from what we have today. Uh, because HR realized that leaders or managers don't talk to their people. So they said, okay, we have to make sure that at least once a year your manager gives you feedback. So they put it into the, into the annual process. What happened? It didn't work. So what did they do next? They coupled it with money. They said, if you want to promote your people, if you want to give them a salary rise and a bonus, you have to do the employee appraisal. So well-intentioned, but the results that we have uh, today um, are not in line with what we initially intended. So we have to say no more. It's time for people operations to really um, shape the future of, of human resources. We natural people of operations is really about inspiring, engaging, and growing talent and create amazing places for them to work and, and to thrive in. And agile people operations uh, pros have to have a strong understanding of the 21st century um, employees and organizations. They have to know what the current talent contract is. Like people today, they seek an experience. They don't look, they want to climb the hierarchical ladder. They want meaning. They want purpose. They want to be some, a, a part of something great. It's no longer about work-life balance. It's about life working. People today are social and mobile. We have to implement those uh, kind of thinking and demands into our people operations. Most of you will probably be familiar with this, um, this model. It's McGregor who said we have two types of, of employees. We have type X and we have type Y. Type X means that um, people are lazy. They don't like to work. You have to 
micromanage them, you have to supervise them, you have to tangle some money in front of them, otherwise they're not gonna move. Theory Y um, says that people are intrinsically motivated, that they work if they believe in what they are doing. They don't need supervision. And those are the type of people that we have in organizations today. And this model is from the 1960s, so more than 50 years ago, so it's not new. And in HR, we've been talking about those two types of employees for a long time, but the problem is it's just talk. We don't walk the talk, so we have to make sure that we change that. But with that saying that we are theory why people, that we are intrinsically motivated, that we wanna be part of something great, also comes a certain set of responsibilities. We can, as an employee, can no longer sit back and say, hey, I'm here with the company, now what are you gonna do for me? No, I have to shape my own career, I have to shape my own growth within the company and liaise with my leader as a coach, as a mentor, I have to liaise with my people counsel, with my talent scout in the organization and help them shape my, my career and, and, and their organization. What does Agile HR mean? We have two components. One is that we transform the um, HR organization to a lean, lean Agile um, organization with, with a different set of teams, and we also shape their solutions. Solutions, instruments, tools, like recruiting, like talent management, like performance management. So both go hand in hand. Um, do we have any um, scaled Agile or SAFE um, professionals in here? SBCs, SBC fellows? Okay, great. In SAFE, the um, HR organizations will be your teams and your trains, and the HR solutions will be your front, like um, your capabilities, your features, your epics, um, and, your, and the enablers, your infrastructure. So we have to address both issues um, in order to be an Agile uh, people operations um, team. Of course, what you see as an employee is the Agile solutions, the HR solutions, um, and the, the positive benefits of the HR organization. That's why I would like to go into people um, instruments. What do we have there? Let me cluster all the different elements that we have in HR um, into the traditional HR employee uh, life cycle. So we have the higher part, inspire, develop, admire, and retire. What do we, do we mean by these different uh, things? Higher, or like we, what we like to call it, talent acquisition, is the whole recruiting, um, employer branding, talent, um, getting talents on board, onboarding. Um, engagement and flow, or the inspire part, is really um, about having great work environments, organizational structure, culture, DNA, uh, performance management, all these elements. The part develop um, is about learning, learning development, talent management, careers within the organization. The part admire is the whole part pay, reward, solution, benefits. Um, the, the, the last part, the retire or separate part, is about how do we separate from people, when do we do it, um, how do we plan our workforce. What I would like you to do is to take just um, a couple of minutes to discuss with the person or persons next to you, what do you see is the key challenge for your team or your organization um, in the HR sphere? Just take a couple of minutes to discuss this. I see there seem to be a lot of challenges. Let me show, get a show of hands. Who says hiring and recruiting is a key challenge in your organization? Who says it's um, performance management and engagement? Okay. Development, learning and development, careers. Okay. Performance, uh, per pay for performance recognition. Okay. And separation. No one, okay, great. <laughs> so we can skip that, that's good. <laughs> okay, that's good, that's good. You can share uh, your insights uh, later. 
Um, let me give you a brief overview um, on how we in Agile HR approach these things. Um, talent acquisition, it's the whole um, hiring and recruiting process. The one thing I want to point out, um, it's a lot about employer branding. And I see so many organizations that have really embraced Agile for so many teams. And they have this great way of working, but they don't actually utilize it when they hire people. Of course, if they hire scrum master or product owner, it's written that they, they obviously work with an Agile approach. But other than that, they don't utilize that. Even though millennials, the young generation, and India will have uh, almost a whole workforce made up of, of, of that generation, they embrace ag agility like no other. So we should, should really make sure to tell people, hey, we're a great company to work for. We are embracing an agile way of working. Um, the other part is that we have to build a strong talent pipeline. And sometimes we forget that the pipeline is not just people out there who are potential employees. It's also the people we have within our organization. And we tend to forget them when we hire. Then the talent acquisition process has to be an experience. Because we, are, as the employer, also um, uh, we have to showcase how great we are. And we have to actually be part of the recruiting process the same as the candidate. Because we apply to the candidate the same way they the candidate applies to, to us. Um, six in 10 organizations already have difficulties hiring great people. They say it's a huge challenge. So we have to make sure to have that. And we have to make sure that we hire people over paper. What do I mean by that? We have to look behind the CV, behind the resume. Because 68% of resumes are misleading. And 63% of IT organizations have found out li um, lies within CVs and falsifications. So we definitely have to look be beyond that. And we have to ask the people, how great are you at working in natural setting? How can you flex your muscles? How reflective are you? These are the kind of questions that we have to build into our recruiting uh, process. And why not do a hackathon, a hiring hackathon? Why not get several eight, um, agile teams together when they hire at the same time and make it, make it an event? Why not um, have, if, let's say, you have three teams who, hire, who want to hire people. You do the hackathon, you identify two people you would like to hire. Why not let your teams pitch for these two people? So I would say, hey, Dan, why don't you join us? Because we are the, big, the greatest team in this organization. We're going to have so much fun together. And the next team says, no, we truly want you because we're working on this really cool stuff. And then you decide what team you want to go into. And I can tell you, the whole team will definitely make sure that Dan is successful. And that is really showing your Agile values um, within this, this process. And then you have to rock at onboarding. Because what happens today in organizations? You sign your contract. You don't hear from the people until you start working. Don't do this. Do it, for instance, like Conquer does. They have an app um, or an access to the internet. The minute you sign, you get that access. And you have learning nuggets and, and videos on that app that you can watch. And people do a lot of the, the learning before they even start working. And they are truly engaged. And we lose people in the first 60 days of starting. So we have to make sure that we make that count and connect with them from day one. The next thing is um, engagement and flow. Today, it's known as performance management. And we all know how, how that's uh, working out. We really have to go to an iterative uh, performance flow and really embrace um, a new way of working and, and, a new, and find the, the right structure um, for us. Um, for instance, um, there are companies who do um, a voting that you vote your managers, that you vote your leaders, like how um, Umantis does. Um, so we can really embrace a new way of, of thinking. Obviously, we have to make sure that we have great leaders. And today, one in five senior managers are dispassionate about their work. So how are they going to um, engage their people if they themselves don't really enjoy what they are doing? So we definitely have to make sure um, that we deal with, with that issue and that we understand the new way of leading people. It's no longer I'm the boss, I'm the manager. It's being the coach, the partner, the mentor, depending on what the, the, the employees need. 
I'm not going to go into too much detail about performance flow. We had a session on that. If you like the slides um, or have any questions, um, uh, come up and, and talk to me. Um, and, but let me say that employee appraisals are disappearing. Already today, 10% of the uh, Fortune 500 companies have eliminated employee appraisals. So it's, it's really starting uh, to happen. Then we have learning and growth. How do agile teams learn? They learn every single day. They learn by working. It's no longer just classroom trainings and that's it. So we really have to embrace those new ways of learning, continuous feedback, interactive learning, social, mobile learning, um, all these new technologies that we have, we, we can utilize them and build that in. And immediate feedback is really important. But it's not feedback that gets reported back to HR. It's feedback between us. And we know today that if someone rates someone, uh, another person, the person who does the rating says more about themselves than they do about the person they rate. Like if you um, ask um, Michael Jordan, um, are you tall? Then he would say, no, you're not, because compared to him, we are not tall. But if he sees someone else who's even taller than he, he would say, yes, he's tall. But that doesn't actually tell you something about the person who was rated. It tells you more about yourself. And if we do 360 degree feedback, that's just going to multiply by seven or nine people. So we have to make sure that we understand the complexity of, of giving feedback and make sure to embed it. Uh, I can give you an example of what Giant uh, Swarm does. They have a set of competencies that are key uh, for their organization. And they define a set of different questions that ask for, for a level of competency for each one. Then every week, an employee rates someone else. It's random who you're going to rate. And you always ask a question, like, is Peter punctual? Then you have a rating scale, one to five. You rate that person, but you also write, what does punctuality mean for me? Then you write in, well, I'm always running 10 minutes late. So yes, <laughs> Peter, if it's two minutes late, is, is punctual. So you write in, what does it mean for you? And that really helps you start the dialogue. But again, it's not reported to any managers or any HR person. It's just between the people doing it. And the minute you decouple it from salaries and promotions, it gets in a, a different way. And you can really talk about the thing and not about the consequences it, it might have. And modern HR organizations have two, or at least two, um, really critical new roles in there. And one is the career counselor and the other one is the talent scout. Because today in our organizations, um, HR people do not really know who their talents are and what their talents are. They might have some lists that came out of an employee appraisal, but they don't really know their people. Let me ask you, when was the last time that you actually spoke to your HR person? Not in your capacity as a manager, but really in your capacity as an employee. Yeah. I was, was with an organization for 11 years. I never ever even saw my HR person. My contract got sent to me um, by my boss's office. That was it. After that, I've never see, seen or heard anything from HR. And we have to change that. And we need to have career counselors who you can approach and say, hey, listen, I'm very happy where I'm at now. But within the next 6 to 12 months, I can imagine to move on and do something different. So they can discuss options without having any, any uh, negative consequences. And we need talent scouts. We need people in the organization who know where the talent sit and what their talents are. So that when it comes to a flexible workforce planning, they know, oh, we can call these three people and approach them and ask them if they would like to move. So it's going to have a different, uh, different kind of, of feel to it. And as we mentioned before, we are theory Y employees. And if we are theory Y employees, we're going to take responsibility for that. We're going to approach the people. But HR is going to be there with the set of, of, of uh, tools and options. Um, and we can really have a dialogue. Pay and recognition. It's always a key topic. Uh, bonuses and how do we approach that. Um, I guess everyone here is familiar with Daniel Pink, Mastery Autonomy uh, Purpose. I'm not going to go too much into that. Um, what I would like to point out is that we have to bring in flexibility and transparency. 
to our um, salary system. Flexibility means that we have to empower our managers to make salary decisions. And that cannot be tied to a once a year event. You have to make sure that they have the authority and the knowledge and the data to do it. The other thing is transparency. We all know about Buffer and other companies that have their salary um, formulas um, where it's very simple. You, you have a specific role, you have your location, you have your seniority level, and that gives you a specific salary. So now you might think, okay, I can't do that in my organization. We are a 10, a 50, a 100,000 um, employees shop. We cannot do that. We have different uh, types of, of uh, job families and categories in our organization. I can share with you an example from um, a chemical company, what they did. They come from a very, very hierarchical background. The people who have been there for a long time still have in their employee contract that you're not allowed to talk about your salary, and if you do, the company can fire you. So that's the type of setting they are operating in. But they wanted to open it up. So what they did is they sent a salary letter to every employee once a year, and they told you what reference role you are and what the midpoint is, the salary midpoint for your role and how you are positioned. So it would say um, you're at 80%, 88% of your midpoint, so you knew how much um, gap you can have uh, to the top or where you're positioned. Um, and you know that you can grow within that salary range. So they try to break that, uh, loosen it up and, and break that, um, that construct that they had and really bring in transparency even though the organization was not ready yet. And they had the unions in there and they signed it off. So um, it's really possible to start doing certain things. And I think uh, one of the speakers mentioned the Trojan horse. And a lot of the things that we start doing in HR are, are a Trojan horse. We have to start loosening it up and, and show them a different way of, of doing it. Um, and then um, another example um, about empowering employees is from a pharmaceutical company. Um, they started having a reward solution center where they gathered all the, the compensation data and, and they set salary ranges for specific roles. And every manager had access to that data, um, data pool. So when they hired someone or wanted to promote someone, they could just choose the new reference role, and then they had the internal and external uh, peer data and benchmark data on there. So they could really make an informed decision and say, that's the new salary I would like to give to that person. And if that was within a given range, they could just send it off. They could press a button, and it would just print your contract. You don't, didn't have to go through legal or hiring or whatever. So they could do it immediately. If it went above 20% um, of the top, they had to contact the reward solution center and talk to them and plead their case why that person um, should, should get a different, different salary. So there are ways of approaching that even though your organization might not be fully agile. Um, and you might have to, to tread more carefully. The last point I would like to make here is about benefits. It's benefits, what, what it includes is um, all pension schemes and, and these things, but it's also about the immediate benefits uh, that you get. And we, we, we sometimes forget to have the health and well-being of people in there. Even though we know today from a lot of studies that if our people are mentally and physically healthy, they are 36% more productive just by choosing the right benefits. And employees today say, if my company gives me a Fitbit, I'm even willing to share my data with them. So they are open uh, for these kind of things, and we have to make sure uh, that we have a balanced, uh, balanced approach. And in order to get the topic of money off the table, we have to find different ways. And we have to understand why there is this run for bonuses and, and for salary raises. It's not just um, to get a financial stability. A lot of it has to do that this is the only kind of recognition and feedback people get in our organizations. That's how they are recognized and awarded. So we have to come up with new solutions uh, to do that. And always have the agile mindset of teams in a focus because the minute we start um, choosing and picking within the team, 
we're going to have this kind of rating in there. And we have to make sure that's really the approach that we, that we want to have. Then new beginnings, um, last but not least, has a lot to do with when do we separate with someone. And there we should follow the approach, hire slow, fire fast. Meaning make sure that you have the right people. But if you see that it doesn't work out for whatever reason, make a cut. If you can find something else within the organization for that person, great. If you don't, help them transition into an external role. But make it with integrity and have that discussion. And I am sure if you have that honest discussion, if you have it right away, um, people are going to be happy to uh, and, and are still going to be great ambassadors um, for your organization if you do that with, with integrity. No. Because um, it's no in the sense that we have them today. It's yes to, of course, we improve every single day. And you know Agile better than I do. So you know how, it, how powerful Agile feedback or feedback in Agile teams is and how they improve on a daily basis. Um, but if you, if you see that it's not the right fit, and again, I'm saying for whatever reason. For instance, Michael Jordan um, used to play baseball at one point in time because his dad passed away, so he quit his, his MBA career and went into baseball. He was decent, but he wasn't that good, which doesn't mean that he's not a great sports person. But baseball was just not his thing. And that's the same in, in teams. It doesn't mean that it's a bad person or a lazy person. It's just not the right fit. And we have to make sure that we, that we account for that. Um, because um, P uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers did a study on this in their own organization. And they said, if we have a team of four uh, consultants, they are supposed to bring in $500,000 in revenue a year. If we have one bad apple out of the four, that's going to reduce our productivity by 30 to 40%. That's $125,000, not counting the, the amount of money that person actually costs in, in total HR uh, costs. So if you, that, those are the things that we forget. Bad people suck the energy out of the, of the other ones in the team. And that's a huge productivity loss that we sometimes don't see. But having said that, we also recognize that it a lot has to do with hiring freezes that we mentioned before, or lack of flexible um, workforce planning. Because the manager knows the minute I get rid of that person, I probably won't be able to fill that spot anymore. But if we um, have ag um, agile workforce planning, if we know our talents in the organization, we can fill those positions quickly. And if someone comes up and says, hey, I was just in a bar last night, and I met a friend, and he wants to go on a, on a sailing cruise. I'm going to join him, see you in six months. You say, hey, cool for you. Off you go. Come back in six months. We have to have that flexibility. We men I mentioned um, at the beginning that people are stressed out. There was a study by Regus um, in 2012 here in India, and they realized that a lot of people, and more and more people, are being stressed at work. And having a um, flexible workforce planning would have reduced their stress by 78%. So we have to embrace those new ways of, of, of working and have to make sure that we don't lose people um, along the way. Uh, because um, the minute we, we part with people, we have to turn them into winning ambassadors. And I've seen it over and over again in so many organizations that we burn bridges. When we, do, when we separate. And that's not the way, uh, the way to go. Sure. Um, the question was um, about hiring slow, firing fast, um, that HR cannot make that decision, that they don't have the, the knowledge to make that decision. Yes, that's right. HR is not there to make that decision. Managers and teams have to make that decision because HR is not going to know, but HR has to help with that transition and have to have uh, tools and instruments ready for that. Um, let me just um, say a couple of words on how to transition. Um, from a traditional HR approach to, to um, lean agile people operations. 
we see that in organizations tightly linked um, to your agile journey. If you just have one or two um, scrum teams, usually that's not such a huge issue. But the bigger you get, the agile organization get, the more you have this clash with, with corporate and, and traditional uh, mindset. Um, but agile HR is a reality. Um, I've just pasted um, a couple of, of comments from, from trend analysis for this year. HR embraces Agile, HR drives the Agile organization. So Agile HR is here, and the time to invest is now. If you started last year, the better, but you shouldn't wait. Because if you wait, you're going to lose out. Because the stuff that we're going to invent in Agile HR, a lot of it is new. And we have to find our way, and we have to do an, an iterative approach, and we have to make sure that we take all that learning with us. Um, this is used, uh, how we typically set it up. We have um, a trigger when companies come to us either with the vision to have 21st century uh, HR organization or they have a specific challenge like recruiting, performance management. Um, we either do a full HR assessment um, or a quick assessment and then we do an initial uh, backlog and, and, and an initial retrospective. We do a value stream analysis. Um, lightweight business case, we train and educate everyone and then uh, have the backlog refinement and then get started. So really setting it up um, as an agile, um, agile approach. Um, let me give you some uh, quick tips and I hardly dare to show you the first one but I'm going to tell you why it's up there. Involve your HR professionals and I'm serious about that. So you think, okay, it's obvious, we want to change something in HR, of course we have to get HR on board. We want to change something IT, we get IT on board. But six out of 10 organizations that, that um, contact me ask me this, do I really have to get HR involved? Yes, you do. Here is the, the problem. Typically, the people that you're in contact with might not be the right people for such a transformation. The people who are great um, at such a transformation are the people who sit in uh, compensation um, and, and performance management teams or in talent management so they, they, they um, strategically plan all the projects. Those are the people that you need. And those are also the people who leave the organization within uh, three to four years because they get bored or they can't do any more um, new initiatives. So those will be the people who really embrace uh, this mindset and can help you out. Then set them up for success. You wouldn't believe how many organizations I've seen that set it up as a project. Okay, they're going to spend 10% of their time, they're going to work on that. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we just meet like once a week. And you know it's probably going to be once every two weeks or three weeks in the end. So set them up like you would any other Agile team. Then training them in Agile is not enough. We have to help them translate it into their own um, setting. What does it mean in HR? Um, we have to guide their Agile journey, give them a full-time Agile coach. So far, I've seen a lot of projects where it's just done on the side, and then that's not going to work. And let them have some fun. Hackathons and open space and all those great things that you have, they do transfer into the different setting. You can do a nature hackathon. They might not necessarily hack, but they can give out the challenge, what does HR look like 2020? What do you expect from your people's people? Then please do cut them some slack. Remember what it was like when you started out in, in, in Agile. And that's the same situation for them. Imagine we train them for two days in, in leading SAFE, and then we expect them to implement SAFE within the whole organization, when no one has ever done anything in an Agile way. So we have to remember that. And we have to remember um, that you have to understand your organization, find your own way. We've already heard it this morning from Scott. Best practices are probably best somewhere else. Of course, look at what other companies do, but it doesn't mean that it just copy paste and works for you. Make sure that you understand why you're doing things and how you want to approach it. And remember, an investment in lean agile people operations is an investment in your people. It's an investment in yourself. And to win the marketplace, you must first win the workplace. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Any questions?
there are a lot of different stories of um, organizations that started to implement various things. I've mentioned a couple um, during the speech, and there are a lot of great organizations on the way to do it. So it's we're in full swing of that transformation. Um, I was in, in London last week with a large bank. We had a dozen um, of HR people to kickstart um, their transformation. I'm having, uh, I'm meeting uh, with an organization uh, tomorrow with 40 HR people who are well on the way um, to, to discuss uh, certain things. So there are no large organizations who have done the full transformation from a like 50, 60, 100 year background to, to a fully agile um, organization. Uh, but there are a lot of organizations out there who have started doing great things where you can learn, where you can, can connect and, and do it. But it's a huge construct. You have to imagine the um, old um, the old framework system or mainstream systems that you had to crumble that all down. It's a huge endeavor. We, we, of course, we can say we get rid of job descriptions and have value statements for teams. But we have to realize what is all linked to those job descriptions. You don't get any salary data anymore if you don't have that. You can't rank your, your people. Um, it's all linked to, to the uh, job evaluation system, in, which is sort of the backbone of your organization. If you get rid of that, how do you do it? And there are certain things that we haven't figured out yet. Like what is career, how is career gonna be defined? Because it's one thing to have career defined within your organization, but those people need something to put on their LinkedIn profile and on their CV that others can understand. So it's probably gonna go into more like a point system that you collect points depending on what kind of projects and expertise you have, um, but we don't know yet. So we're really in the middle of shaping the future in HR. And we need you, we need your agile, agile knowledge and, and your, your actual um, agile uh, power and enthusiasm to do it. Because you've gone the way, we're, we're still not there yet and we need your help to, to get there. Um, I've been shown that we have, <laughs> but I'm I'm around, so you can come up and ask questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. One question then. I'm happy to tell you one model that, that you would work. I can get, give you examples of different models uh, that work. But one thing is we eliminate employee appraisals. And there is no, no one thing that takes, uh, takes over for that instrument. It's going to disappear because it's so embedded in the workflow that we give feedback and that we interact and, and that we learn and grow that we get rid of employee appraisals. And we have, the, we have your talent scouts, we, we have your managers, we have your, your peers who recognize who the great people are. Because I can ask any one of you to ask to point out the best performer in your team. And you will be able to tell me. You don't need an annual appraisal to do that. So we have to be honest that that's the way it is. And we don't have to, do, to go um, in and do it another way. And you have companies. Um, like uh, Spotify, for instance, who have a great model um, to, to really thrive um, on that. Netflix has, has a, a slightly different model, but they are truly agile as well. So there are different ways of, of approaching this. But employee appraisals are going to disappear, and there's nothing that comes in. And we always get asked, like, we don't want to do the appraisal. We don't want to do the, the ratings. But we still want to make sure that every individual is, is, um, gets their fair pay and is paid for performance. But the minute you say you pay for performance on an individual level, you have to put in some yardstick and you have to measure against that yardstick. And if you don't want to have appraisals, because we recognize it's not working the way we think it, it would work, then we can't do that. We have to do it in an, a team approach. And bonuses are more going to be about profit sharing. 
if the company does great, everyone gets something. And the teams either decide how to split that bonus, um, bonus among themselves, either everyone gets an equal share or depending on, on seniority level, um, but it's a team that actually decides. And it's about uh, just the performance of the whole company. Okay, I'm gonna take more questions um, offside and then, exactly. Thank you, it was my pleasure, thank you so much, thank you.